and godliness. So I praise God for each and every one of you today. Uh, we are excited to have you in this place today, and we're excited what God is doing in each and every one of your lives individually. Uh, we serve a God that's so great that he can be concerned about us as a group, as a church, and be concerned about you individually all at the same time. Isn't it wonderful that he's not just narrow-minded, he's not just singularly focused, that he can be concerned about you and everybody in this world at the same time. And we love God for that, and we're grateful to have him uh, be a part of our lives in this day. We are in a series called Trust the Process. I need y'all to scream that at me and say, I am trusting the process. I am trusting the process. Oh, say it again like you mean it. Say, I am trusting the process. I am trusting the process. Today we are in part three of Trust the Process. Um, I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and we'll be starting in the 13th verse. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, we have it on the screen for you. In all circumstances, if you're able to, what I ask you to do is you can stand on your feet to honor the reading of the word of God. I know there's a lot of things that, that we stand up on our feet for. You ever been to a sports game? You stand up on your feet and you cheer and you want your team to get the victory. Well, we can stand up on our feet when we read the word of God because we know we got the victory. Amen. And praise God from wherever you're joining us from this morning. We thank God for those that are in the house. And we thank those, God for those that are joining us online. Matthew chapter 16, starting with the 13th verse. And it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That is a blessing to know. Verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And I'm sure they would have loved if the scripture would have stopped at this point and they would have gone on on their mission and they would have continued doing what they were doing. But Jesus had more to tell them. Verse 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day be raised to life. Verse 22 says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Boy, did that change quickly. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. That's the word of God for the people of God. Say it one more time like you mean it. Say, I'm trusting the process. I'm trusting the process. You may have your seats in the presence of God. I'm going to be real honest with you this morning and share something that really grinds my gears. Something that really grinds my gears or might I say someone, some people who grind my gears are people who think they know it all. <laughs> like they got all the information that's ever been presented in the world, that they have all the knowledge that you could ever imagine they could get, that they just think they know everything. You can say simple, something simple like, I like these pants that I just got. And they'll look at you and they'll say, uh, well, actually, 
those are chinos. And uh, according to my Reddit feed, nobody really wears those anymore. <laughs> Somebody who really just thinks they know it all. You can see something simple as like a, a, a puppy walking down the street. You can say, oh, that is a really cute puppy. And then they hit you with the, well, actually, that is a full grown dog. And it's called a Datsun, not a puppy. It's fully grown, OK? People who just really feel like they know it all and they want to share that information with you. And, and they, they act like uh, they give you this information. Even if you don't ask for it, they're going to provide it to you. Right. They just really feel like they just know everything and they can have insight on everything. And I'm looking at them like just because you got a Google search like everybody else <laughs> doesn't mean you're privy to something that I don't have or something that I actually even need. I don't need that information from you. But but sometimes. Unfortunately, we get so caught up in our own opinions that, that we ignore everything else that goes against it. And we demean anything that we don't agree with because we're so caught up and we think we have all this knowledge and, and that we think we're so smart and, and we're so informed that we talk down on something else that we don't even have knowledge of. As we look at our scripture, unfortunately, this happened to Peter. Peter got himself caught up in a place where he thought that he had all the information that he ever could need. Why is that? Because Jesus was talking to the disciples and he asked them, who do people say I am? Who do the people claim that I am? And the disciples answered from the people's perspective and said, the people think that you're John the Baptist, which doesn't really make any sense because John the Baptist was already dead at that point. He said, well, some of the people think you're like a prophet, like Elijah or, you know, uh, maybe Jeremiah. You know, they think that's who you are. He says, OK, it's nice that you know who the people are. You're aware of who the people are, uh, think I am. But who do you say I am? The people that are walking with me, that are there with me on the daily, who do you say I am? And Peter, in all his boldness and all his confidence, stepped up and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He stepped up boldly and he stepped up correctly. Jesus even replied and said, you're right. In fact, that knowledge was given to you from God himself. You were given that knowledge of who I am through God himself. And in fact, this information is so pivotal that this will be the stone that the church is built on. The truth of me being the Messiah is what the church will be built. I will build my church upon this rock, upon this pillar, upon this stone. This is what the church is built on. That I am the Messiah and I am the true and living son of God. This was pivotal information. This was extreme information. And I'm sure Peter, when he got that information and found out that God himself revealed that to him, he felt like he really understood things. <laughs> he felt like he really knew exactly what was going on at that point. He said, I figured out the biggest mystery. We've been waiting for the Messiah and I figured it out. He probably really felt like he understood what was going on. And I'm sure Peter and the disciples were so excited about that news. That was good news. The Savior is here. The one that's going to come and save us has arrived. And at this point, I know he figured, felt that he had figured it all out. And he was excited, not just because the Savior, the Messiah was here, but in his mind, he felt like they were about to get delivered from the oppression that they were dealing with at the time. See, the Romans had come in and they had taken over the Israelites. And before that, they had been under subject to many different nations. And so he was thinking the Messiah is here. So now we're about to get back in power. Now those Romans and, and, and Caesar and all them, we ain't got to listen to them no more because the Messiah is here and we're about to take over power again. And I can imagine that excitement being quelled up and them getting ready and, and getting prepped up. And then Jesus follows with this information, he says that I have to go to Jerusalem. And when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer from the chief priests and from the elders. And those people there, the leaders, the teachers, they're going to persecute me. And not only are they just going to persecute me, they're just not going to uh, chastise me and tell me to go on about my way. But they're going to kill me. Amen. Just imagine the shift in the atmosphere when Peter goes from knowing that the Messiah is here and that he had got a word from God and then all of a sudden Jesus turns around and says, but before anything else happens, I first must be persecuted and killed. Peter came in and said, Jesus, well, actually, <laughs> I don't think that's what's going to occur. 
you're probably not going to do the way you think you're going to do. I should come in and let you know. And he was polite about it. You know, he didn't call him out in front of everybody. He said, Jesus, come over here. Come talk to me. He pulled him to the side and tried to rebuke Jesus and tell him how wrong he was about what he had just given them, about the information that he told him was true. It's like being in a class and getting one answer right. You know what I'm saying? When the teacher asks a question and you raise your hand and you get the answer right. And then when the teacher goes in to explain the next concept, you jump in and say, uh-uh, teacher. <laughs> I know that you have a doctorate degree and all this experience, but me and my knowledge, doesn't look, that doesn't look right to me. And that's kind of what Peter did here. He jumped in and responded and told Jesus, that's not it, that you're wrong. Never that is what he said. He said, never will that occur. And Jesus said something very strong in response. He said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the concerns of the kingdom. You have in mind human concerns. You have in mind the concerns of this earthly kingdom and the things that are going on right now, and, and you're looking at the Roman uh, guards and, and saying, I can't wait till we can take over them. Not thinking about the work of the kingdom, the bigger picture that needed to take place. Focused on human concerns. And the simple explanation in all of this is that after Jesus gave these explanation of what was about to happen, that Peter did not trust the process. He did not believe that by Jesus dying and being persecuted, that good could come from it. Jesus gave him the outline of what was going to happen, yet Peter did not trust it. He was afraid to accept the words that God had made plain. And I want to use Peter's experience today to kind of guide us to identifying what God's plan is and how we can trust it without looking at it through our own eyes. How we can trust in God's plans and say, if he says it, I can take it to the bank. Yes. If it doesn't make sense to me, that's all right. If, if it doesn't agree with my human nature, that's all right. all right. I will trust in the process and exactly what he has told me will take place. So for those of you who are taking notes, I want you to write this down for my first point. That the word of Jesus is dependable. Okay, okay. Jesus' words will always come to pass. His words are dependable. And it's, it's very possible for God to deliver a clear word and we disregard it because of our own agenda. God can make something abundantly clear to us and we can write it off because we don't feel like it aligns with the plans that we got going. See, like Peter, we, he understood broadly who God was. Because he said it. He said, you're the Messiah. You are the son of God. But the problem was he broadly understood who God was, but he did not understand God's plan. All right. So he had an idea of what Jesus, who he was and, and, and kind of what he was supposed to do, but it was broad. And because he only understood broadly what was going on, he did not have a clear view of what God's plan was and how it was supposed to take place. And it's unfortunate sometimes because we come up with this perception of God and we think he's supposed to do what we want him to do, when we want him to do it, how we want him to do it. And we ignore anything that doesn't align with that. <laughs> if it doesn't match the way we perceive things should be taking place, then we write it off. Okay. We say, no, that couldn't be it. That, that couldn't be God. That's not how I play. Anything that, that we see contrary to what we want, we'll try to correct God. <laughs> We we'll say, God, I, I know you, you, you set me up for this, but this, this isn't exactly what I wanted. This isn't what I planned. And, and, and we look at scripture and we see things that says that, that God will uh, give us the desires of our heart. But we have to make sure that we delight ourselves in the Lord in order to get our desires in the right place. And when we mix those things up, God can be providing us things that we need, providing us things that will open up the door. But if our perception is messed up and we're not looking at it the right way, we'll disregard what God meant to give us for good. Because our perception, the way our perceptions are messed up. Jesus was giving Peter this prophecy that this, this prophetic fulfilling truth, all these things that the prophets had spoke about before. Jesus was saying, this is going to come true. I'm going to fulfill those things. But because it did not align with the emotions and the desires that Peter had inside of him, 
he disregarded it because it didn't align. The facts didn't match what he felt. And so he disregarded it. And it's so sad that we see that in today's society so much that if the facts don't line up with the way we feel, we can say, well, this is my truth. This is how I look at this. This is my perception. And we will disregard factual statements from authoritative figures because it does not align with my perception. A couple of weeks ago, uh, um, two of my friends were, were having this discussion. And uh, I use the word discussion lightly because it was an all out argument, knockdown brawl um, about sports. They're nothing serious. They were talking about sports. And as they were talking about sports, uh, they were they, they, they brought up my team, which is the Cowboys, as you all know. And um, I'm a realist. I'm a realist. I, I, I know that if we don't have the squad in line and we don't have the, the right players at the right positions, we're not going to do nothing. You know, we'll be at home during the playoffs. We're not going to make it. But this guy who was um, a Cowboys fan also was talking to somebody who was not a Cowboys fan. And he argued with him uh, after last season that we can go to the Super Bowl and still win regardless of what happens. And the other guy said, okay, well, um, what, I mean, you're taking this to the extreme. What if y'all went 1-15 last season? Y'all really think the next season y'all can make it to the Super Bowl? And, and he said, I don't care what we did the previous season. I always got faith in my team regardless, and we can make it to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and me as a realist, I, I enjoyed his, you know, his, you know, encouraging speech. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that facts have to align with the emotion that we have. And you can be passionate about something. You can be really strong and really wrong if you're not careful. Peter was passionate about that. He had the truth in front of him. Jesus gave him the truth. But because it did not align with the way he felt and the way he viewed things, he tried to correct the word himself. Jesus, who is the word, he, created, he was there at the beginning and he tried to create, uh, correct Jesus. It's amazing how we can get off track so far when the truth is in front of us and he's given it clear to us exactly what needs to take place. And because of our emotional state, the way we feel, the way that I look at it, my perception get us off track. We should, we should pray and, and ask in Jesus' name that, that his will be done. He told us that we can have what we receive if we pray for it. And, and the word is true. It is true. But let's make sure that we're praying that the will of God be done in our life. That he do it his way. So, I mean, if I'm asking God, if I'm praying earnestly and I feel that God is showing me that, um, you know, he's got something bigger for me in, in the realm of my profession and in, in my career. And, and, and if I'm praying and saying, God, get me this new job, get me out on this new job. Uh, show, God, show me what you got for me. Put, put me in a new position, put me in a new place, God. Take me to a new job. And all I'm getting is more work on my current job. All, all I'm seeing is my, my manager pressing and giving me more work to do and, and upgrading my workload. But I'm looking at that as like, oh, man, God, you said I, you said you were going to give me a new job. And here you are pressing me and making me work harder at my old job. Not realizing that God could be prepping you and setting you up for a promotion exactly where you at. God could be giving you more experience exactly what you need to go further. But you're neglecting it and writing it off as annoying and, and, and being overworked. And, and I'm so tired about what's going on when God is trying to set you up for something greater. He's trying to put you in position so, so that you can receive what he has for you. The truth is there in front of you. But are you going to write it off because it doesn't align with your emotions? It doesn't fit my box. This isn't how I saw it. This isn't what I thought was going to happen. And so instead of wasting your energy and wasting your breath trying to correct God, take a second and listen to his word and understand that it's dependable. That the things he said will come to pass. And there's no reason to try to rebuke him or, or tell him where he's off pace. Adjust your thinking. Put your emotions aside if you have to. We are, we are emotional people, and that's okay. That's fine. But when it interferes with facts, then we have gotten off track. The second thing that I want you guys to understand when we are dealing in this circumstance is to set your focus to godly concerns. Set your focus to godly concerns. It's incredible how fast 
Peter goes from being the mouthpiece for God and proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah and he's the son of the living God to becoming the mouthpiece for Satan and rebuking Jesus, telling Jesus that he was wrong. He, 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 he went from, uh, he did a complete 180. Like, it's amazing how fast it's in. And I'm sure Peter didn't intentionally speak on behalf of the devil, right? I don't think he did it on purpose. But unfortunately, by telling Jesus that he was wrong about having to die, what he was doing was he was promoting Satan's will. Satan would not have wanted anything more than to stop God's redemptive mission through Christ Jesus to save the world by, by, by preventing him from going to the cross, by, by not allowing Jesus to complete the mission that he had. And, and I know Peter didn't know how God was going to work that plan. He probably couldn't see it the same way. He didn't know what the plan for humility, uh, humanity was. But at the end of the day, that's the point. He didn't know. He didn't know. And so because he wasn't focused on what God's word was and because he wasn't focused on what the plans of the kingdom was and he was only focused on what benefit he would have and how he would be a part of a royalty when they took back over the kingdom. He missed the groundbreaking revelation that Jesus was giving him. Jesus was telling him right there at that point how he was about to reconcile the entire world back to God the Father, how things would be uh, changed forevermore and people would have an eternity with God because of what was about to take place through his death. Yet he turned a blind eye to it because he was not focused on kingdom building. He was not focused on spiritual kingdom building. He was focused on how they could build an earthly kingdom. Jesus had already told them in Matthew 6. He had told them, don't worry about what you'll eat or don't worry about what you'll drink or don't worry about what you'll wear. You know, he told them plainly not to worry about those things. But he did tell them, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. And I got to I got to think maybe if Peter had been focused on the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he wouldn't have been so concerned about these other things that would have come with the kingdom of God and his righteousness. <laughs> Focused on every other thing except for what God's business is. Focused on trying to build up this empire when God's kingdom needs to be built up. Focused on the wrong thing, not understanding the true purpose of what Jesus was there for. And because of that, Peter missed out on the truth of what Jesus was saying, giving him the blueprint of exactly what he need, focused on those small things, focused on those things that really will never amount to anything when the kingdom, which will last forever, because only the things we do for Jesus will last, focused on the small and insignificant things instead of being focused on the kingdom. I remember I was in college and uh, we had group projects every now and then. And um, I, I typically really didn't like group projects because a lot of times there were people in the class that I just didn't know and didn't know what to expect. And occasionally you would get this one person that came in into the group with this idea of how exactly they wanted things to look and how exactly they wanted things to go in the project. And they were, uh, you know, type A personality and they, they wanted it things their way. And so there was a particular person that I had this project with and the project was more about the information than it was about the look of it, right? Yeah, we were presenting the information, but the, the PowerPoint could be as plain as ever, and they just wanted to know the information that we studied. But their focus when we got in that group together, they had this vision of this beautiful PowerPoint and these uh, physical examples and all these things they wanted to show when the main purpose of the project was the information. And so they spent all this time putting together this PowerPoint and putting together all of these examples and trying to make it look real pretty. And after they finished that, guess what they still had to do? Gather the information that all the rest of us had to do. So they doubled their workload, maybe even tripled their workload, trying to do all of this design and, and make it look so pretty and, and do all these different things. And the professor could not have cared less. He didn't care what was going on with the designs. He wanted the information. That was the main purpose that what we should have been focused on. We should have been looking at the information, how to get that all together. But instead, they wasted their time doing something that was insignificant, that had no benefit in the end. It did not affect our grade no other way 
uh, for, because they did a fancy PowerPoint. It didn't increase our chances of getting a higher score because they, their designs were nice. It was about the information. And what I want you to know today is to focus on the main objective. Focus on kingdom building. Focus on doing things for the body of Christ. Focus on making sure that Jesus is exalted and lifted up in your life. Those small things ain't going to last. Those small things will only affect you for a season. But the kingdom of God will last forever. Stop wasting your time on those things that don't amount to anything. Stop focusing on those things that, that, that won't last. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good that, that you got a thousand followers on, on, your, on your Twitter, but I promise you in a year nobody's going to care. <laughs> you need to get to a point where you're kingdom building, where you're doing things that are uplifting God's kingdom. We can't exert all this energy on, those, on these small things that, and, and chasing after the things of the world that, that will provide us nothing in the end. I can guarantee you that it's good to have money, but at what expense are you getting that money at? How, how much of your effort are you exerting chasing after this money opposed to doing things that, that would uplift and benefit the kingdom? How, how much are you chasing after that career that you've neglected your family? That, that you're no longer present the way that you should be because you're focused on this temporary goal and gain. Only what you do for God will last. Set your focus on kingdom building and kingdom business. And I promise you that, that God will not only begin to reveal truths to you like he did to Peter, but it'll also begin to open doorways for you so that you can have a pathway to get to that victory and the thing that he promised to you. But it's going to require you to focus on the kingdom, building the things of God. And finally, thing that we need to remember is don't overlook the promise miracle. Don't overlook what God has promised to us, the great things that he has set before us. See, Peter gets upset about the notion of Jesus suffering, right? He gets shaken up by the fact that, that Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer. But what Peter completely ignores and what we might look over the first time that we read this scripture is the fact that he said in three days, I'm going to be raised from the dead, <laughs> I, I'm going to die. Yeah, they're going to kill me and persecute me. And then I'm going to come back to life <laughs> like dead and then back alive. And they just looked over that. <laughs> Peter doesn't look at the miracle. He said, hold on, wait, you have to die. <laughs> and he didn't listen to nothing else. That's all he heard. He said, you what? And it's incredible because that's not something plain. That's not an everyday occurrence. There's not too many people that are just rising from their grave. And it's incredible that he overlooked that because of the, the trauma that happened initially. It's crazy that we can be sad about the storm and the rain and not think about the crop that grows on the other side. We can get so upset and, and so consumed with, with the dirt and not realize that it nourishes the plant that's underneath so it can grow and that we can be nourished. We can't get so concerned about the process and, and, and the, the negative things that we may have to face in the meantime and forget about the fact that there is greatness on the other side. But it's going to require there's going to be a little dirt there. <laughs> there there's going to be some rain. There's going to be some storm that we have to go through. But don't get intimidated by the storm because the task after we complete the task. There's greatness and blessing on the other side. There's a miracle on the other side of that dirt. There's a miracle on the other side of that storm. There's a miracle on the other side of that depression. There's a miracle on the other side of that heartache. There's a miracle on the other side. If you would press through what's going on right now, the suffering that may occur right now, greatness lies on the other side. I was talking to one of my friends who was, uh, he's big into fitness, right? And uh, he was doing this big fitness journey and he was going like four months. He didn't have no carbs, uh, you know, no, no sweets, um, no fun, basically. Uh, and he was spending all this time training for this uh, this competition where he could get on stage and, 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 you know, show off the work that he'd done with his body. And I couldn't just imagine going that long, not being able to eat uh, the way he eat and had this serious diet. Like he missed Thanksgiving. Right. Uh, he missed his birthday. 
Like, so like all this time training during those things, missing out on those opportunities to, to eat the way you want to and, and, and enjoy those times like you wanted to. And he did all that. And um, I remember asking, like, why would you put yourself through that much suffering? Why would you go through that? And I remember his response was very candid. He said, uh, well, after I win this competition and I get on stage and I, I leave with my trophy, I get to order a large uh, meat lover's pizza, eat it all by myself, gorge on it, I'm talking about, eat real good, and then look in the mirror and see my six pack abs after eating a full pizza. <laughs> now most of us could not have imagined even having six pack abs and certainly not after eating a pizza. But in order to get this extraordinary event to happen, he had to go through the suffering of training of working, of denying himself, of, of being without what he want. And it's miraculous that he can look and flex and be strong after eating something so completely unhealthy. But that, which I consider a miracle, happens after the fact that he went through the process, that he suffered a little bit, that he had to deny himself, that he didn't get to do exactly what he wanted to do. That he had to turn down that soda, that he had to turn down that piece of cake, that he couldn't do exactly what he wanted to do. And while he might have suffered mentally in the end, he had the reward of the desired look that he wanted all along and was able to eat how he wanted to, to do what he wanted to, to move in freedom the way he wanted to and still maintain the image that he had. So maybe today, you can achieve the image that you want, but you cannot skip the process. You can't jump to the end. <laughs> I tell you, if I eat a full pizza, I'll look like I'm pregnant. <laughs> but he can do that because he endured the process. Because he went through, he suffered a little bit, and he got to the place that he desired to get to. I'm here to let you know today, you can't skip the steps. Look at somebody and say, don't skip the steps. Not skip the steps. You got to pray a little bit longer. You got to get in your word just a little bit more. You can't skip the process. You got to hear what God says and oblige what he's telling you to do. You cannot skip the process. But instead, trust it. Trust the instruction that God has given you. Believe that the things that he's telling you can come to pass. We want the end result, but it's going to require us to suffer a little bit. It's going to require us to get uncomfortable. It's going to require us to say, God, not my will, but yours be done. So if you're telling me this is the only way, I trust you. I don't want to be the mouthpiece for Satan. I don't want to spew these things and, 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 and speak death in the situations that should bring light. Peter was speaking what, what was supposed to change the world, and he was trying to tear it down before it even took place. Don't allow people to tear down the word that God has given you before it even takes place. The easiest time to take something out is in its infancy. It's easier to take out a baby than it is a full-grown man. It's the same reason why they wanted to, to kill Jesus before he was born. I mean, before he, before he was a man, before he grew up, before he was two years old, they wanted to take him out. It's because it's easier to take out a child than something that's full grown. So I'm encouraging you today, hold on to what you got. Keep pressing through this process. Keep pressing through and God will be able to show you a miracle on the other side of it. Don't overlook the beauty that lies in eternity. I know it may be rough right now. and I don't know what you're going through individually, but I can promise you, that there was a beauty that lies ahead for each and every one of us. And so today, let's make it our goal to say, Jesus, I trust you. I don't understand what you're telling me. It doesn't align fully with what I think should take place. It's not how I would have done it, but that's okay because I trust in you. I trust in you as my master. And it's incredible that Peter would even talk back in that situation because you know a teacher a rabbi shouldn't be questioned by his people that he's training up today we should acknowledge Jesus as that teacher and say regardless of what you're telling me you telling me I need to love somebody that's unlovable I can do it it doesn't make sense to me I should be I should have anger and malice towards that person but you telling me I should love them I'm gonna do it 
You, you telling me that, that, I should, that I should be a giver, that I should be generous, that I should tithe, that I should do this? Ugh, my bank account, not quite aligning with that, but because you told me, okay. I'm going to make that decision to do it. Okay. And I'm going to be generous in my giving. We got to get to a point today where we trust in God's process. We trust in his instructions. And we say, regardless of what's going on or what factors try to prevent me from getting there, that I will believe that his word will come to pass. What I'd like to do is let's just pray together and ask God to instruct us and lead us in this time of trusting him. Father God, we thank you today for your love and kindness. We thank you today because you speak to us, Lord God, and you have not stopped speaking to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. And Lord God, we ask today that you would help our unbelief. Father God, that you would strengthen us to have faith in your word and regardless of how it sounds and how it looks, that we would trust you with faith. Lord God, believing that it would come true, that our actions align with the faith that you've given us. We're grateful and we're thankful. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. amen. And right now, before we end this time together, I want to give anyone who has not accepted Christ Jesus an opportunity to make the best decision they've ever made in their entire life. I promise you that I have come so far, not because of my own ability and because of the skill that I have and the things that I've accomplished, but because of the love of Christ Jesus and God the Father. And so today, if you're feeling that you may be lost and you're not understanding the storm that you're going through, I wanna let you know that there's a friend named Jesus that can carry you through. And so right now, if you feel a tugging in your, in your stomach and you feel something is ushering you, I want you to know that don't get afraid, but that's just the Holy Spirit saying, Jesus is beckoning you. He stands at the door and he knocks. And so what I want to do for all of those that are about to accept Christ Jesus for the first time, I want us all to pray this, uh, this prayer on one accord and give you an opportunity to make this decision that will fully change your life and your eternity. Let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe you rose from the grave. So this day, I make you my Lord and Savior. Take my heart. I'm now yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's make some noise for those that just made that decision to accept Christ. Your life will never be the same from this day forward. I'm proclaiming prosperity. I'm proclaiming God's favor. I'm proclaiming that God will work in your life, changing your perspective for the better. God bless you and amen.